So the 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 task this week is quite involved, uh, as you've probably noticed, and um, essentially to to sculpt your model with inside Mudbox, so to sculpt the high res version, and uh, in addition to that, add on texture maps. And if I go back here, texture assets in Mudbox, and so we're looking for a diffuse map, which is just the painted map and mm -hmm. also to generate normal maps and ambient occlusion maps and I'm going to talk all about that today and try and explain what those are and how to generate them um, because the, the the course doesn't really go into that in much detail I didn't think so I think it's important to cover that so first things first have you heard of a normal map before or an ambient occlusion map yes I've heard of them okay I know what a normal map is I'm not sure about the other ambient occlusion. I know okay. what ambient is and I know what occlusion is, but together I'm not sure how that works. Okay. Well, what I'll probably do is just go through some images to explain uh, the three types of maps I wanted to talk about just for the purpose of the recording, so anyone okay. watching this can, can get all three of them. So, to begin with, I'm going to talk about a displacement map, which is not required for this course, but it's important to know where the technology stems from. So, if you take a look at this really nice low res model here of, of the head. Can, uh, can you see this okay? Yep. Cool. So this would be our low res model that we currently have inside 3D Studio. And then the next phase would be to take this into Mudbox and generate a high resolution version. And you can see on the far, the far right hand side here you've got the high resolution uh, sculpted version of this mesh. Now this is great but it's completely Im impractical when it comes to bringing this back into 3D Studio. The poly count is so high that you'd never be able to uh, really run with this unless you had a really insanely powerful computer. So a displacement map is where we capture the detail that we've sculpted inside Mudbox, save it out as a map, bring it back in, bring the low resolution version back into 3D Studio and then use that map to tell 3D Studio how to subdivide the model at render time. So this is not uh, in the 3D view. In the 3D view in 3D Studio you would see the low res model and then when you hit render you would see the high res model. So you kind of have the best of both worlds. The low resolution to work with and the high resolution when you render out. So this is this is the production workflow for uh, film work and any kind of high resolution pre-rendered imagery but it's completely impractical for games uh, you can't do this in real time so we have to find another solution and that's where normal mapping comes in so normal mapping is where we have our low resolution mesh we sculpt it in high resolution in Mudbox and we do the same thing we bring the low resolution version back into 3D Studio but we've generated a normal map which preserves the details and so you can stick that normal map on the low resolution mesh inside 3D Studio and you can observe the details in real time. So the benefits are you get <coughs> a really uh, fast fluid high, uh, high resolution image well it's it's a trick it's just a lighting trick so it looks great but the drawbacks are you're still dealing with a low res mesh so if you look at this mesh here, you'll notice how you kind of got these jagged, triangular shapes at the bottom of the chin. Those still are preserved mm -hmm. because we still have a low-res mesh, but we have that cool lighting effect of that normal map on top. So it's kind of like you're bridging the gap, and you've got the best of both worlds. You've got that uh, low-res mesh for speed, and you've got the high-res detail, but it's an illusion. Okay, ambient occlusion. This is where uh, we essentially preserve lighting information uh, of our high-res model in Mudbox and we preserve that lighting information into a map. So it's essentially ambient light or reflected light and it's, it's not direct light, there's no specularity involved here, it's just if the light's bouncing around my scene or around my room where would I notice small detail shadows in the crevices? So if you look on this model of this old person here, you, all, all this skin texture here, 
all this area where the light can't quite reach it and you get shadows forming and so we can essentially save those shadows back into a map and the cool thing is we can use this in a million different ways and there's a number of different ways depending on your pipeline as to how you would use this um, but we're going to use it to essentially add extra detail into our diffuse maps so give the illusion of detail again it's kind of going to be uh, an extra bonus if you like so the two we're going to be focusing on are normal mapping and ambient occlusion mapping. I see Nathaniel's joined us again. Hello. Or maybe not. Anyway, moving on. So let's let's actually work on a project and and discuss what we are going to try and achieve. And um, this is a uh, a quick model I threw together for this exercise. It's by no means awesome but it, hopefully it'll illustrate the the purpose of what we're trying to do here by the way I'm back I'm eating so I'm muted so that's what's going on. <laughs> not a worry not not a problem thanks for joining us and that's a pretty good looking strawberry just saying it's 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 a little ugly as far as issues but you know it does yeah, the job. I eat it <laughs> yeah it's a little hyper real anyway um, <laughs> Let me, let me open up 3D Studio here and I'd like to show you what this model might look like. So if you imagine where you guys are right now with your project, you should have a low resolution, or maybe you started sculpting, that's okay, but you should have a low resolution version of this strawberry. So here we go, basic, basic, nothing too exciting. And I want to talk about a couple of do's and don'ts before we export this guy, a couple of things that it's really important to consider. You want to think about, first of all, how even your mesh is. So you'll notice that if you look at the, the body of the strawberry here, it's pretty even. Um, the polys are smaller here. You'll notice I've left it at quads. Try, uh, don't triangulate your mesh here. Uh, Mudbox works best with quads. And you'll notice that there are, there's no bunching going on here. If you start bunching up your mesh in places, and when you sculpt in Mudbox, you're going to get insanely high detail just where that bunching occurs, and it'll be horrible and, and totally obvious, and I, I kind of learned that the hard way. So try and keep your mesh as uniform as possible. That's a really big point. The next part is to make sure that your mesh is behaving itself, and by that I mean if I select this and look at the Edit Mesh modifier here, let's go and select all our faces. I'm going to turn on show normals and I can adjust the scale of my normals and do you guys understand what a normal is? Yeah. Essentially just the, uh, the front side of our polygons. So a lot of meshes that people create accidentally get their normals flipped. If you look inside this mesh you'll notice that our normals are facing outwards but if my normals were flipped they'd all be pushing in and that would cause major problems in Mudbox. So, like some drops we know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like we saw in the tutoring session on Wednesday. So, if that were to occur, if my normals were facing the wrong way, what you have to do is apply a normal modifier to this, and you can see that there's this option here to flip the normals, and you can flip them um, according to just the faces you you need to flip. If only some of them are reversed, or you can do the whole mesh at the same time. So that's not an issue here, so I'm not going to worry about it. So what I'm going to do is just uh, collapse this back down to an edit poly, and I'm going to export this guy out. Now, you will notice if you're using a newer version of uh, 3D Studio that there are features uh, where we have send to and we can send to Mudbox. I'm not going to lie, I, I hate these features. They They give the illusion of being really easy but at the same time they kind of do whatever they want to do and they don't really <laughs> they don't really always uh, adhere to best practices so sometimes they'll treat maps differently than you'd expect you'll see these options in Mudbox to export back to 3D Studio or Maya and again you never really know what you're going to get you don't know how it's going to handle your maps how it's going to put them back together again and so what I'm going to show you is the traditional way to do this by hand to try and show you exactly what you should expect when exporting and importing. So, 
With that said, I'm going to select everything here and I'm going to go to export. And I'm just going to export the whole scene actually. And I'm going to decide where I'm going to export this guy to. We'll do live session strawberry example. And you have a choice of formats here. The the new kid on the block here is FBX and it's an awesome format, but for simplicity and knowing that you're going to get exactly what you expect, I am going to use an OBJ. It's a more of a, a simplistic format. And I'm just going to call this straw strawberry. And you can typically leave these at the defaults. Just click export and done. And that's it. You've exported it to a non-native format that will open in pretty much any package out there. Another thing I should have mentioned was to be very cautious of your UVs. Before you export this, it's paramount that you have your UVs set up. And like I said, this was a rushed example, so my UVs are really ugly, but they at least they're laid out. So try and avoid as many seams as I have here, but this will work, this will do. But just so you know, I have UV'd this. All right, let's jump into So what happens box. if you do have a lot of seams? Well, that's a really good question. And I was talking to Nathaniel about this the other day in our tutoring session. Um, there's two ways to texture. There's the old school way where you take your UV map into Photoshop and you paint. And what you'll notice there is, let me load 3D Studio back up again. If I open these up, if you imagine if I'm trying to paint this in 2D using Photoshop, the biggest problem is, all right, you're painting, 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 painting. What happens when I get to this seam? Well, I've got to try and paint this so that it's seamless from this point here to the point where it joins up here on this part of the mesh. And it's really tricky to paint seamless textures just using Photoshop. And what you'll tend to find is that there's misalignment that goes on. So you think that the little um, seed that I might paint here would perfectly align here. But what you'll typically notice is when you look at your model in 3D, there's this mismatch and it doesn't join seamlessly. That's using the old school method. Typically these days we use Mudbox to paint textures, um, or most people do. And Mudbox takes care of that problem for you. Because you paint in 3D space, it translates your 3D painting directly to the 2D UV space. And so it takes care of the seam matching, and it'll match those seams pretty closely, making it much easier for you to, to texture this. So the general rule of thumb is you want to use as few as seams as possible because you never know when you're going to have to manually edit this texture. Um, but many people these days get lazy and just let Mudbox take care of the UVs, which is really kind of bad practice because you, when you're applying for a job or if you're, you're trying to show that you're really good at this stuff, you need to be able to show that you can UV correctly and that you can produce neat UVs that anyone can read and understand. So okay. that's kind of the two schools of thought there. Um, okay, if I were to do a new scene here, I want to get this part over with fairly quickly because it's not the bulk of what I want this to be, but I'm going to import, and you can just open up the OBJ that you exported, and you'll get uh, the low res mesh. I can hit W to look at how that mesh sits on the strawberry. and the good the general rule of thumb is if you're going to make large edits here you should make your large edits moving the mesh around uh, on the low res mesh before you start subdividing it so if I were to grab my my grab tool for example you know I want to make some big edits here to make my brush bigger you know I can kind of pull this mesh around very easily making these, these these large edits, you know, I can kind of pull the, the base down here as I see fit. Once you're happy with those larger edits, just gradually start to subdivide the mesh. And I'm going to go up quite high here because I'd like to show you some detail. Uh, let's go to one more. And you're going to have to decide if you're bringing in multiple meshes or single meshes or a single mesh. That's totally up to you and how your model is designed. In this case, I've got two meshes. So if I go to my object list, you can see I've got the body of the strawberry and also the stem. And so if I need to 
subdivide the stem. I have to grab that, shift D, and I can subdivide that down to add as much detail as I want. So really all I wanted to do here is show you a trick for sculpting, which is one that I kind of learn and I, I really enjoy using. It's it's quite practical. First things first, let's let's just focus on the strawberry for this. And I'm going to use my select object tool to deselect it. So it's going to be working on that object even though it's not selected. And it's very good practice to work on layers. Never work on your original mesh because you never know when you're going to want to undo something that you decide later on you didn't want to do. So let's just call this, you know, detail. And you can add as many layers as you want and you can adjust the opacity uh, as I showed in previous videos. But what I recommend you do for this exercise really is you make use of uh, stencils and stamps. And in this case I'm going to show you uh, stencils. So let me navigate to let's see navigate to this project folder which is on the network so I'm hoping it's going to work ah oh, the joys of live sessions <laughs> <laughs> all right it never fails. Whenever you want to show something, it doesn't work. <laughs> Murphy's Law. <laughs> you got it. All right. Please bear with me just one second. Let's grab some reference imagery here and throw it on my desktop. And I'll just find it on the desktop. Ref. All right. Some images of strawberries. So I'm going to choose this folder here and I've got some images of strawberries that I used when I first did this actually let's zoom out a little bit here so with these reference images are you going to need to like cite them at the end or combining them all together like this as long as it's not like that one image do you need to worry about anything like that or what did you have to take these pictures Oh. That's a good point. I mean, to be honest with you, f for schoolwork, I generally say, you know, um, it's okay to use existing imagery, sourced imagery. The truth is, right. if you want to put this in your portfolio, though, it's better to take your own images. And actually, I was going to rebuild this, and I, m I took a whole load of pictures of strawberries, and the, m the main reason for that is I couldn't find a single strawberry without any darn specular highlights on it. And when you take, when you have source imagery like this, you really don't want any um, external lighting because you want your lighting to come from your 3D lights and not from the images that you've sourced. So you can see all these specular highlights here. Those are permanently going to be burnt into the texture which is actually pretty bad. You want your texture to be as neutral as possible and you want your detail and your 3D lights to actually take care of that. So really there's, there's a lot of advantages to taking your own images, not least of which when you're in an interview you can say, hey I took these images, I did this all myself, you know. Um, that's kind of how I would yeah. I would approach that. Makes that. Sense. So I'm gonna I'm gonna grab this just for the sake of using this, and I'm going to use this option up here, which is set stencil. Click on set stencil. I'm gonna go to my 3D view, and you can see that stencil is overlaid here. I'm gonna turn off my wireframe. I can hold down the S key, and I can move this stencil where I want it, just using the standard mud box. However, you have your mud box hotkeys set up and you can move this into place and you're kind of ready to go here. Now first things first, a word of caution. The technique I'm going to show you requires that you're going to always be able to come back to the same camera position. So it's really good to make use of the new feature in Mudbox which is camera bookmarks. I'm actually going to save my current camera position. I'm going to call this you know front face or something like that. So if I later accidentally move my camera like this, I can just click on front face and it snaps back to exactly where it was. And with stencils that's really important because you don't want to move it and have to try and realign everything again. So what I'm going to do is, using my layer that I've created, I'm on my highest subdivision level here because I'm actually detailed painting at this point. And I'm going to use my standard sculpt tool and I'm going to just try this out. That's a little light. In fact, you can't see anything. So let me undo that. 
Let's increase my strength here. Let's try again. There we go. Okay, so Insto Strawberry appearing here. And this is all I did for this strawberry. I did this several times. I moved it around and I merged it. If I hit the Q key, I can hide my stencil. You can see how that is. Let's put all that detail in. And the reason I saved that camera bookmark is because I'm going to use that same stencil to paint my diffuse map at the same time. This is a really handy trick. So, I'm going to go to my paint layers here. I'm going to add a new paint layer. And I'm just going to call this Strawberry Diff. And I'm going to create a diffuse layer. Now, this is just for you to work on. It's the high res version, so if you can do it, it's okay to go up to a 4K texture, but for most systems, a 2K texture is best. I'll use a PNG, you could also use a TIFF, and make sure that we're working on our diffuse channel here. And I'm just going to click OK. And then I'm going to use my projection tool here. So my paint tools, projection, and if I hit Q, my stencil comes back exactly where I left it, only this time it's in color because I'm actually painting a color texture now. And just to prove this, I'm going to use my camera bookmark to revert back to exactly where I was. And now, with the magic of television, when I paint this, my diffuse map lines up perfectly with that texture map that I cr with that uh, sculpting that I did earlier. And so you'd do these one after the other, so you wouldn't just go around it, texture it, and then go around it, and then uh, apply this projection map. Yeah, to be honest with you, I like to do it in stages. I do a bit of sculpting, bit of texturing, bit of sculpting, bit of texturing. Oh, that's not good. I don't know where that came from. Anyway. Um, I'd say you're getting green, but that would be a lie. <laughs> so, you know, you can do your texturing first, and you can actually use a feature in Mudbox to displace the surface of the mesh using your texture, which is another technique I've used. But these days, this is the technique I like to use because everything lines up perfectly, and your uh, sculpting is just that much more fine and accurate. That makes sense, although my workflow, what I would want to do just from like what I've done with 3D Studio Max, it's like we construct the scene and then we apply the textures uh, or we animate it and then we apply textures, one or the other, and then like it's systematic in how we do it. And this seems like, all right, now paint here, all right, now color it, now paint here. You don't color a picture while you um, draw it. Painting, though, is where you color and paint at the same time, but... Uh, if you get well, this staying. this is um, I I, I ac absolutely hear where you're coming from, and that that is my traditional workflow for working in 3D Studio or Maya. However, stencils in Mudbox are a whole other beast, and if you if you can imagine trying to text, if I move this out the way here, and you can imagine I'd sculpted my whole strawberry, and then I tried to apply my projection with my stencil. Let's load up my stencil again here. Now you're faced with the task of trying to line this bad boy up with your stencil. Right. And that is a that's a hair pulling task. That's gonna drive you crazy. I can so, easily tell that. It's so just kind of a pity that like there's no faster way to stick with that old workflow, but it makes sense and thank you for explaining. Well you can if you texture first and then sculpt from that or if you paint your uh, it often depends on what it is you're actually doing like if I'm doing you know um, I don't know tiles or something then I might sculpt them and then go in and hand paint them or apply a different kind of texture that isn't related to the texture I use to sculpt them so it, it kinda depends on what you're trying to do but if the two are, are intertwined which they often are this is the technique I would recommend um, okay and I kinda like could you, of course, it would be kind of cumbersome, I think, but because um, I'm agreeing with Nathaniel, to me it would be easier to sculpt it, but I can see why this would be like really a good way to do it. But could you set up different cameras while you're sculpting, and then you have all those cameras, and you can come back and paint based on each of those cameras? You can, but you can't. St you can't save your stencil positions. 
So oh, okay. the the go. these are kind of up to the mercy of where you last left them. So you know it's 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 totally up to you guys, but I learned this. I'm just this. really bummed because that means I'm gonna have to redo my whole buffalo. Well, not necessarily. It depends on on your workflow and and how you decide to do this. Um, but I kind of learned this the hard way, and this mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of this information I, I think is pretty priceless. To be honest with you, it's going to save you a lot of grief in the future. <laughs> so <laughs> it's uh, it's totally up to you guys, though. Um, I did not I like being saved from grief, so no complaints. I'm not going to lie. I did not use that technique when I first made this strawberry a long time ago. And uh, I really wish I had. <laughs> what what I actually did was I I sculpted it. No, I'm sorry. I textured it first, and then I used uh, the texture to displace the geometry. So let me come to my layers here. Turn off the diffuse texture. It it worked okay, but the 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 sculpting isn't as tight. This is a really high res object as well, and it was a little bit erratic. So uh, it took it took a lot of cleanup. I had to do a lot of smoothing, and I it, this isn't finished. And you can see where some pockets go out correctly, some pockets go in because of the light source. Um, so this is a different workflow, but again, it's not the traditional sculpt then texture workflow. <coughs> so let me uh, let me get this back to where we were. So let's say you finished your model. And we're now ready to export this guy out to use inside 3D Studio. I want to try and get to this point next. Uh, let me show my objects. The first thing we have to do, and if stuff goes blue like that, it means that Mudbox is loading the texture. So sometimes you think you've frozen your object, but it just they actually used the same color to show you that Mudbox is in its loading phase. Um, if it stays blue, it means that you run out of graphics card memory and it can't handle it. And sometimes you just have to reload the scene. Um, so if we're ready to export this, we have to do two things in this case, three things. First things first, we have to export the diffuse map. Now, if you have created your paint layers in multiple layers, you are going to have to compress these down into a single layer. And you can do that quite easily by right clicking and if you have multiple layers you can do merge visible and it sends those down to a single layer and once you've done that you can just export it to a PSD and that'll save that diffuse texture however because I just did a single layer I actually have all of these textures already created in my Mudbox working folder here and you can see this TIFF file which is loading in Photoshop isn't that speedy let me load this up in preview. Uh, you've got CS6. Thanks, I'm still Lee. back on CS4. <laughs> uh, you, you know, as a student, you actually have, you should have received an email to upgrade to CS6 by now. So you actually I have. I wish. I went through a whole hairball with uh, a couple classes ago, arguing with people that are like, hey, you don't need to use this, you don't need CS6. I'm like, but but I thought we get discounts, so it, ugh, it was just a pain, and so I don't know if I want to deal with it or anything, but I've looked through my email and I haven't gotten any notifications on CS6. Okay, if you haven't, you, you I just you got mine, like, it was after the term started. It was like three weeks after the term started when I got mine. Yeah, that that's about the time they made the switch. And if, if you haven't, Nathaniel, I highly recommend you contact the support center because that's some pricey software that you can get for free. So um, yeah. I, I highly recommend it. And what I would do if I were you is actually install CS6 alongside CS4 and run them side by side for a few months. And then when you're ready, you can make the full switch over to CS6. Um, okay. I like so, the user interface of CS6 more for what it's worth. But anyway, continue. So here's my uh, texture. When you're when you're creating game textures, the truth is you you should be saving these down to JPEGs or whichever format your game engine is going to be working with. And you have to think about the resolution of these textures. I'm not too worried about in this class because it's more about the workflow than the final output. 
but just know that if you were actually creating this for a game the chances are you'd have to resize this down depending on the game engine maybe to 1024 if it's a, a non-important character maybe 512 but for the purpose of this exercise I'm, I'm going to stick at 2k so I can show you the details I'm also going to leave it as a TIFF file but uh, that would not be used in a game environment because it's very uh, large and inefficient so I've got those textures there exported next I have to ex export my I'm going to mute you Nathaniel if you don't mind or actually would you mind muting yourself just because I'm getting a little bit ah there we go thank you very much I was getting a lot of feedback there um, so we have to export this as a normal map. We want to capture this detail from the high res mesh. If I page up here, you can see I'm at you know 1.2 million polys, which is insane for 3D Studio. Absolutely insane. We want to capture this detail and we want to export the low res mesh. So what I have to do here is go to my uh, well first of all I have to select the object that I'm dealing with so I'm going to do my strawberry first and I'm going to go to maps extract texture maps and I'm going to do a new operation and you'll notice I've done this a million times here before so I'm going to do a new operation and you can save the operation that you do so if you get it wrong or if you need to tweak it or try again another time you can reuse this where it's already been set up and it'll overwrite your existing file so let's do strawberry normal map norm. and I'm going to select normal map from the options here and I'm going to go add selected to add my strawberry body that is selected and you'll notice it adds it at level 0 that's that insanely low res version that I exported from 3D Studio and then here we have the source model for the high resolution version so if I click Add Selected, you'll notice it adds the same thing, my strawberry body, but at level 7, the insanely higher version. What it does is it looks at the differences between the low resolution version and the high resolution version, and it saves those differences into a normal map here. So what I'll do is leave those set up. Be very cautious to note the levels that you decide to use here you want to make sure that you export the level that you actually generated the map at so in this case level 0 the search distance is kind of a uh, kind of a beast to itself I generally click on best guess and nine times out of ten that works just great for me and I usually leave these at the default then we're going we're going to define our output texture file so we click on the browse button and navigate to my project folder example here we go PNG will work fine for this TIFF would work fine as well and what I'll do is I will save this as strawberry norm and click save. 8 bits per channel It's just a standard 24-bit map and when I'm ready I'm gonna click on extract. It's gonna go ahead and produce that map and give me a nice colorful normal map. Click OK and I'm done. Now one thing I should have mentioned is that you want to be very careful to make sure that when you imported this into Mudbox, the first thing you do is check to make sure that Mudbox correctly imported your UVs as you left them. And if I lower the resolution of this object down, you'll notice 3D view, my UVs are there. And what it's done is it's generated this normal map. You can see it's this awesome colorful map here. And what this is, is it's using red, green, and blue to determine not just the depth of these details like a traditional bump map which would just be black and white but also the direction of the details so uh, I, I forget the colors I think blue is the depth I think red is either up down and perhaps green is left and right 
but those three colors combine to determine the depth and also the direction of these details. So that's been preserved into that image map correctly and you want to check that map, make sure that it's preserved uh, as you would expect and if it, if it looks glitchy, it's going to be glitchy when you use it. So you'll have to troubleshoot and figure out how to solve those problems either by changing the search distance or messing around with those settings in the export options. Okay, one thing I forgot to show you, which I can show you now when I do this next example, let's work on the let's work on the stem this time. So let me select the stem, go to maps, extract maps, and I'll do strawberry norm again to use those same settings I had before. Only this time I can remove the strawberry body and add the strawberry stem. Same as before. The stem goes up to level 5 but I want to start at level 0. Click on best guess and this is the guy we're interested on. Preview as normal map. What happened when I first did this is I left that on and it actually placed a bump map in my paint textures here which is really a kind of a pain. I hate that feature. So I actually prefer to deselect this option here but I'm going to go ahead and extract that texture map. Click OK. You'll notice this time it didn't bring in that bump map. Check my UVs. And I can't see the normal map because I deselected that option. But if I check my folder here, oh, as you can see, I'm not very clever. I overwrote my existing file. We'll call that stem. Okay, let's come back to Mudbox, select the strawberry body, run that same procedure again, normal map, remove, and add the strawberry body, make sure that option is deselected, best guess. Oh, I forgot to talk about map size, didn't I? This depends on, on your system, but also, you know, again, what would the game engine that you're exporting this to expect? You know, a 2K map is going to be probably way too high for a game character, but just for this example, I'm going to leave it at 2K. And make sure that your output file is correct and extract. So kind of a roundabout way of showing it because I made a mistake there, but hopefully you get the idea. Just be very careful that you don't overwrite your existing files. And you are recording this, right? So you can go back and watch it. Yep, it's it's recording as I as I do this. Okay. And let's see, I probably refresh. There we go. So we have on my other screen here the body normal map and the stem normal map each one preserving all that detail from the low res to the high res mesh so that's our normal maps done excellent alright back in mudbox next let's talk about ambient occlusion ambient occlusion and as I said is a way of capturing ambient light to mimic shadow areas on your object and you can use those in many different ways uh, I can give you an idea of what ambient occlusion looks like because um, let me deselect this Mudbox actually has what are known as viewport filters and it simulates ambient occlusion using your graphics card and if I deselect let's come back up to the high res mesh here this guy, make sure that's on the high res mesh. With ambient occlusion turned on you can actually see that additional details here are being, uh, being brought into this viewport display. So the cool thing is if I lower down my... Oh, you can't really see it. It's a little hard to show you but you can see these extra shadows that are appearing here and it's kind of like real-time ambient occlusion 
That's not what we want though. That's just a viewport trick. So don't be don't be confused by this ambient occlusion option. So if I turn it on and off, you can kind of see those shadows pop in. Let's turn that off. Let's generate some ambient occlusion maps. So first things first, again, select the mesh that you want to export. Go to render. Oops, I'm sorry. Maps extract and we'll do a new operation. I'll select ambient occlusion map and don't be tempted to add all your meshes at the same time because Mudbox is clever and just decides to uh, put them all on a single map which doesn't work. So do them one at a time. Again add your level 0 and then add your high res version just like before. Select both the calculation size and also the map size here. Sorry, this is the calculation size, this is the map size. Just do 2K, that'll be fine for this example. And you can tweak these settings, but it's best to, to actually leave these at the defaults I find and tweak the map in Photoshop. And then decide on your output location. So I'll do it here and I'll do just a PNG. I'll do strawberry ambient occlusion, save, and I'll just do deselect, preview as diffuse, extract. It takes a long time to do this, so you can see why this kind of effect would never work in real time, at least not effectively. 3D Studio actually does ambient occlusion when you use the realistic option in your viewport. So when you have this set to realistic and you move the camera and you have lights in the scene and you see all those dots that get finer and finer and finer, that's actually real-time ambient occlusion. So it can be done in real time, but games typically don't use this because it's too much drain on the graphics card. And my mouse has disappeared. Extracting. You can see why this would never work in real time to this level of detail because it's taking what a few seconds to export just one frame. So when you're trying to run a game at 60 frames per second, that would never work. Click OK. Let's take a look at what Mudbox has actually generated for us. You can see it's generated this ambient occlusion map. It's tried to sh save that shadow detail into my texture file here. I'll do the same thing quickly for the stem. Render uh, maps, extract. We'll just do a new operation, ambient occlusion, add selected, add selected. Oh, I just want the stem. Again, I'll do a 2K map just because I'd like to demonstrate this detail here. Select my output file, stem AO, save it as a PNG, and deselect that option. And that'll go ahead and do the same thing for the stem. So tweaking those settings there decides on how fine the detail is or how uh, spread the shadows are and also how much contrast you have but a lot of that can be tweaked inside Photoshop. And actually Mudbox is kind of cool because it uses your graphics card to do a lot of this. It's a lot faster than the CPU so I can actually hear my graphics card fan ramping up here. That's it. We've exported everything we need. We've got our normal maps and both of our ambient occlusion maps and this one looks a little crazy but it should work okay so the last thing we need to do then is export the low resolution mesh back to 3d studio and the reason we do this is because if you've made any big changes to the mesh then those big changes will be used to calculate the normal maps and the ambient occlusion maps So you want to make sure that you, uh, you're aligning the maps to the correct mesh. 
and it won't align correctly to the original mesh. So what I'll do is I'm going to lower both of these meshes right down to level zero. Remember that number was key when I exported those maps. I did them both from level zero. So then if you're using layers you have to be careful of that, right? If you um, make any changes on while you're in a layer because then that book can you uh, if you go down to the lowest level and you've added detail, let's like, say at level two on a layer, mm -hmm. what? I'm not this, sure what I'm asking. I, I know what you mean. <laughs> I know what you mean. In fact, you can see it here. You see how I've got four layers here, and mm -hmm. these say seven, seven, seven. So, like you, I think what you're saying is that yeah, these were created at level seven, so wouldn't they be lost here? Mm -hmm. um, the truth is they're not actually lost, they're just preserved. So you can't edit them at this level, but the details have been preserved and brought down to this level. Okay. So the changes you've made here will be minute because it's such high resolution, but mm -hmm. nevertheless they will be reflected in the low resolution mesh. Okay. So I'll just select my objects and make sure they're both at the lowest level. File, Export Selection, and yay, Folder Hierarchy. have to find everything again. <laughs> okay, Example, here we go. And so what I typically, you know, I try and name these accordingly, you know, Strawberry Mud Export. And again, try not to use an FBX here unless you really are prepared for the results because it's going to bring all my maps in with that FBX file because the FBX are that much more intelligent. So what I would actually recommend is to simplify things for yourself and just use an OBJ. Save scene. So I do have a question. You, When you originally exported from 3ds Max to go into Mudbox, you kept it as quads. Mm -hmm. But when we were when we were working on our projects. You wanted us, didn't you? Want us to make them in tries? Yeah, and I don't think that's going to be too much of a problem, to be honest with you. I think Mudbox, I think Mudbox simply represents the tries as quads, as best it can. Because um, my 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 Buffalo, I turned it all to tries, and I brought it into Mudbox, and it seemed to be fine. Yeah, I, th I honestly, I don't think it'll be a problem. Um, um, someone's tea is done. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that's my daughter's. So hold on. <laughs> and she must be mad. <laughs> she got it. <laughs> uh, it's just got to wait for my hearing to come back. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> okay. Shell shock. So, first things first. Back the in funny 3D. thing is, is I could barely hear it with my earphones on. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's open up. Be sure to open up, oh I'm sorry, new scene, don't save changes, be sure to import the strawberry that I exported. Make sure I don't accidentally bring the original back in. And default settings work just fine typically. And yay, there we go, it's all brought back in again. So the last step, which is not necessary this week, this week all I want to see are screen captures of your model inside Mudbox and also those maps that you've exported. That's all I need this week. But next week you're going to be tasked with the challenge of compiling everything back inside 3D Studio. And so that gives me another week to rebuild my buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really, I really don't want you to feel like you have to rebuild it. I think you'll to be honest with you, I think that it won't be it won't be as noticeable if you as you think if you simply Well, you know how perfectionists are. <laughs> oh yeah, I know, trust me. <laughs> I, I I suffer from that myself. <laughs> um so yeah, I would I would encourage it, but it's not a must. That's what I would okay. say. Okay. Um so we gotta set this up next week, uh to display these maps and so I can show you really how this works. So what I'm going to do is bring up my material editor and oh look at that I've got all the maps left over from when I first did this. So let's start from scratch and I'm going to show you how you can compile these together uh, 
to get an idea of how this works. So I'm going to create a standard material. And this is for next week, right? Yeah, don't worry it... about. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, don't don't worry about it this week. But I I want to make sure that I at least show you guys how to do this. Okay. Um, I'm gonna create a standard material, and I'll just call this, you know, strawberry. And I'm going to apply my diffuse map, just as a bitmap. And oh, okay, let's see, game character creation week eight, and. I'm going to find those maps. Again, typically for a game these should be JPEGs, but for this example I'm just using those TIFFs that I created. Alright. Alright. And if I apply this to this and turn on realistic materials with maps, nothing too spectacular, what we'd expect. So the magic happens here when we start playing around with normal maps and using those in 3D view. And to do that, what I'm actually going to do is temporarily delete the connection here so we just see the model as is. To bring in the normal map, we bring it into the bump channel, but you've got to be careful here. Resist the urge to simply apply that normal map to the bump channel because traditional bumping is black and white when we're actually applying a color normal map so what we have to do is when we click on bump instead of bringing in just that bitmap we are going to bring in a normal bump node and it's going to attach that to our bump mapping here and to that I can apply my normal map into this normal input here I'll select my bitmap here and I'm going to navigate and find my normal map. In fact, I'll probably use the one that I created earlier. And you can see, kind of, a rough idea of what this normal map looks like. It doesn't look very spectacular right now, it just looks like, you know, a poorly done bump map. So the most important thing here is to change this value from 30, change this all the way to 100. That's going to bump that right up. Make sure you're in realistic mode here to be able to view this in real time. And for added bells and whistles, it makes sense to create a light to test the normal map. So I'm just going to add an omni light to do this. I'm going to have to take off. Yeah, not a problem. You, uh, you can always refer back to the recording when uh, okay. when I post that later tonight. Awesome. Th Thank thanks. you. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Melanie. Appreciate it. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye. So, Nathaniel, you can see that when I brought that uh, Omni light in, you can see how that normal map works as a lighting trick. You can see how it's showing all that high-res detail, and the added bonus is we have a really low-res mesh here. So you can see that looks really nice. At least not too shabby. Indeed. So, combined with our diffuse map, you'll see the two together. I need to break. switch into that mode because I'm currently in the material one where it's got the um, the um, spheres instead of that mode. So I gotta switch over to that one so I can see the relationships. Okay. So, with that guy applied, uh, we can then decide what we want to do with our ambient occlusion map. There's a few different ways you can use this. You can use it in many different ways. You can generate, you know, use it to create dirt maps, work with it specular maps. You can even apply it back to your normal maps in certain ways, um, or bump maps, sorry. But uh, in this case, I'm going to show you a couple of different ways you could use it. Depending on the game engine you use, depends on how that ambient occlusion map would be used. So let me load up the one that I created inside Photoshop and show you one way that the ambient occlusion map could be used. Uh, let's see, we want to go into this guy, this guy, this guy, and I'll load up my 
strawberry ambient occlusion map here. This is one I created earlier using slightly different settings. What you can do, and what a lot of times game engines will do, is the game engine won't be designed to handle an ambient occlusion map by itself. So what texture artists will often do is simply paste this over the top of their existing diffuse texture and simply apply a multiply and suddenly you've got that shadow information on top of your existing diffuse map and obviously this looks pretty strange here because of the way that I exported this map but you could go ahead and you could apply levels, you could tweak it, you can adjust it it's not an exact science by any means, you basically do what you need to do to get this to look good let me apply a clipping mask to this to clip it just to that layer so bring out the whites you can kinda see that detail coming in here it's it's subtle because to be honest with you if I were doing this I would extract that that um, AO map again to get better results to get more detail showing up there but that's one way you can do it however we can also simulate that multiply effect directly inside 3D Studio and there are two ways to do this and the reading for the uh, the class next week suggests that you add it into this additional bump node here so why don't we start by trying that let's bring in the ambient occlusion map and what it does is it puts a standard bump on top of a normal map and you get this overly disgusting <laughs> kinda I would not like that one yes it looks ugly so you typically have to come down and, and lower the value here to lessen the effect but you can see that not only are my specular highlights being affected here but so is the the core shadows as they drop off on this object and in fact what I should have done what I should have done when I created this standard object was give some specularity to the material let's do this so uh, add a frost burn. no we can't leave it anymore throw it out <laughs> see how those specular highlights interact with the normal map indeed so look how low res that object is and yet look how high res that, that, that detail is as we do this so this is used in most modern games and it's kind of a necessary workflow and most modern graphics cards are designed to utilize this technology and we're used to it these days but the truth is it is awesome and it's revolutionary indeed so the other technique you could do here would be to instead of applying it to the bump node uh, to the additional bump would be to apply it kinda like we did in Photoshop but to the diffuse color here so what I could do is delete this connection from the map to the diffuse and double click my diffuse color and apply a mix node and I could attach my bitmap to color 2 and let's take a look at this mix node see what we've got here you can see that we're mixing black pure black with our diffuse material and what we do to decide how much black and where to apply the black is we use this mix amount control here and essentially we can tie our ambient occlusion map here into our mix amount wait for this to load up Ta-da! what that gives you it's pretty cool is those shadows really carefully applied and you can utilize the curve editor just like I did with the levels in Photoshop you can utilize the curve editor here to change you know how intense that black is at the upper and lower so you can see how I can increase that shadow so it looks disgusting or I can bring it back to soften the effect and that's what the game engine would do 
So that would typically be handled by the, the game engine if it would utilize an external ambient occlusion map. But that's the workflow. In fact, once you've done that, you can delete it from that additional bump control. You know, you could use them both together. It's, it's totally up to you how you build the shader. And standard map, mix the diffuse with the bitmap for the diffuse color, with the ambient occlusion for the diffuse color, and apply a normal bump node with that normal map up going in. And with the magic of television, if I show you the one I created earlier, I did exactly the same thing for the stem at the top. Nothing different whatsoever. Yep, yep. You can tell I can kind of play it around with the values here to try and make it look a little less disgusting and a little more natural. But look how that interacts with the light, and that's exactly what a normal map should do. It should preserve all that detail from Mudbox on an, on an incredibly low resolution mesh. And same thing's happening here on the stem. So nothing different on that additional stem texture that I created up here, all set up in exactly the same way. And that's it. The workflow from start to finish, going from 3D Studio, sculpting, and exporting your maps and then rebuilding it back inside 3D Studio. That's the workflow. Oh yeah, that was really interesting. Any uh, any concerns or questions from that? Um, from the whole process, no. I think uh, they've all been pretty well adju uh, addressed. The 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 likelihood, well, the, the areas that you're likely to find problems are going to be when you export your maps. To be honest with you, if if the meshes, you know, goes inside out, or if your normals aren't set up correctly or if there are problems with your UVs overlapping, etc., then your your maps that you export will show errors, calculation errors. And when you bring it back into 3D Studio, those errors will be plain as day. So it's really important to, to keep looking at those maps to make sure that you get what you expect. You can see there are no errors here, and it's exactly what I would expect. But if I saw like triangles appearing or like big blotches of blue or or green, right. you know. Anything that looks abnormal in the map that makes it look like it's not actually a normal or a texture map. Exactly, exactly. But if you keep checking that, double check your settings, you should be A-OK. -okay. If you just kind of keep keep uh, being cautious of your steps as you go, you should be OK. Good deal. There is one thing that I was curious though about, you know how you were exporting as an object, right? OBJ file, yep. Right. After you've exported all these textures and you've exported all these extra um, the models as objects and everything else as OBJs, um, after all that has been exported, um, this is probably jumping a couple weeks ahead in uh, questions, but how is the game engine going to take that? Is it going to take all these files that we use in Max, take them all and then it's going to put them all together in whatever the system is for the game engine that's uh, currently playing these. Yeah, um, exactly. Yeah. It basically it depends on both the platform you're designing for, and also the um, the the type of engine that you're using. So, you know, you have all these different game engines for PC, and you have um, different platforms like Xbox and PS3 and it depends on how powerful the system is, what the game engine can handle. You know, some game engines won't be able to handle ambient occlusion maps, and other ones will. Um, right. So, what typically happens is you, inside 3D Studio, if I remember correctly, you'll have a plugin which will be proprietary for your game engine, and typically it'll take like an OBJ file, and it'll export it into a format that's designed specifically for that game engine and it'll export it uh, maybe with uh, probably not with any of these materials applied but the game engine itself will have its own way of handling texture files so the game engine will take the uh, the uh, ambient occlusion map it'll take the normal map it'll take the diffuse map maybe even a specular map if if it can support mm -hmm. it it'll plug it all together 
and inside the propri proprietary game tools like perhaps the Unity engine or something like that you'd be able to tweak the specularity the effectiveness of the ambient occlusion the normal mapping you'd probably do that in a third party tool and that's how it would look in the game so you you wouldn't really you wouldn't typically test it in 3D Studio that much you'd you'd really test it in in the tools designed for the game engine okay because those are going to be exactly what you see is what you get you know that's what it's going to look like when you load it up on the PS3 or or on your PC or whatever okay and so for each of these platforms uh, this then goes into programmers who have figured all this much out so that's why it's us as gra uh, 3D graphic designers we just export all these things by working in 3D Studio Max we make the characters, the animations, etc and then we just export them and then the um, uh, programmers take care of the rest of it Is that exactly exactly summary? that that's that's why they have the um, <clears throat> the the game and simulation program which essentially deals with the back end and how you work with producing tools to handle the information that the artists give you the files the texture files the 3d files so two very very related job descriptions but two very different job descriptions right good question all right, well, that's what was um, running around in my little hamster wheel mind uh, for most of this, so I'm glad I got that answer. That's what I've been wondering about for a while. Yeah, it's, it's a little confusing, and you'll often find, you'll find that tutorials to utilize, tutorials to generate ambient occlusion maps are abundant. They're everywhere. But tutorials to actually use the ambient occlusion map, maps back in 3D Studio are kind of few and far between, and that's because... Um, you typically either bake it in Photoshop like I showed you or you handle it in a game engine a proprietary tool um, mm -hmm. so it's 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 maybe a less common practice and these days we typically r calculate ambient occlusion at render time using ray tracing okay if you're doing a you know a pre-rendered scene fair enough but yeah, yeah. that's probably everything I was going to show you today, unless you had any other questions? No, that is it. Um, sometime I'd like to know about all those materials up there. That like, Do you have like a quick 10 second thing that you can say about each one from advanced lighting all the way down to X reference material? <laughs> a little bit uh, much. <laughs> pr probably not, not quickly. Um, really these are different these all have very specific purposes. I could point out a few off the top of my head. I'm just um, dying to know why that one is red and why that other one is blue and why the other one is invisible or gray. That's that's really is what's driving me crazy right now. <laughs> These are just default previews of what that material type looks like when you first apply it. And each material type is tweaked to give a very defined, specific type of look. So an ink and paint shader, for example, will give you a kind of a cartoony effect, like if you had the Iron Giant, for example, that movie, uh, where they had the 3D robot, but they had it rendered in such a way that it looked like it had been 2D painted. That would have been using a cell shader, such as the ink and paint shader. Okay. Um, DirectX shaders are optimized, I guess, for uh, your graphics card and DirectX technology. Um, Standard shaders are kind of your bulk, basic, default 3D Studio Max shaders, and they'll give you Fong, uh, Fong shaders. Let's see here, Fong. That's why we like them. Yeah, Blin, Fong, Strauss. Essentially, how you handle the highlights, and uh, and how you can plug in different maps, etc. And you get ray trace materials that utilize the ray tracing features of your rendering engine, and ray trace was really nice, wasn't it? It's awesome. Lighting, it, yeah. Yeah, that, that's what gives you those sharp shadows and also reflections, refractions, and all that good stuff. You wouldn't be able to get that with a standard material, so you'd have to use a more advanced ray trace material for that. And then you okay. also have, um, uh, if I have, uh, let's see, ray trace, come down here. If I turned on my my render settings for mental ray I'd also get a mental ray shader here which was optimized for use with the mental ray uh, rendering engine so 
um, those shaders are optimized for speed and also effectiveness when you're using mantle ray to render your scenes. Mm -hmm. So it all depends on very specific purposes and some of these I'm not too sure what they do. Some of them are very simple like double sided. It allows you to put a texture on both the normal side of your poly and also the reverse side. Uh. Um, shell, shellac, these are ones I haven't really used too much but again they're very specific effects. Uh, there's a very very defined purpose for using these different types of materials. Okay and if you ever needed to know which one to use like it would be pretty like blatant saying we need to do this and you'd be like oh this is what this material would be used for. Yeah exactly okay. I mean y you might want to do a really cool lighting effect where you know depending on how you look at the object you kinda get that you know kinda quirky let's let's say a hologrammatic effect you okay. could achieve that by using the normals on the surface of your objects and then however the normals are facing in comparison to the camera you get a different color and that might have you know a very specific material to do that um, I could tell you in Maya, but it's been a while since I've done it in 3D <laughs> Studio. <laughs> right, right. So, but yeah, they all have a very specific purpose. All right, and that's another thing that I've been dying to know since I saw them, because I first get in 3D Studio Max, and then I open up the materials, and I'm like, oh great, which one do I choose? Yeah, most of the, nine times out of ten, standard or ray trace are going to be everything you want. All right. Well, that is uh, has exhausted my questions for the day. All right. Well, I appreciate you turning up, and thank you for asking questions as well. Yep, no problem. Thank you for putting up with the questions. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you have any others. Just send me an email, and we can always go through in a, in a live session or something. Will do, and I'm sure I'll be reviewing this video again, and I'll have that wonderful, ugh, I'm hearing my voice kind of sound. So. <laughs> All right, well... Uh, good luck with your project, and uh, have a good evening, won't you? Yep, you too. Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thanks a lot.